Good morning, and welcome to the 18th Annual Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm John Parrish Petey. I am the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And NEH is proud to sponsor this year's Understanding Our World stage. An independent federal agency, NEH was established in 1965 under LBJ as part of the Great Society legislation. And we're rooted with our sister agency, NEA, still in that cause. Our agency supports museum exhibitions, documentaries, books that bring history, literature, philosophy, archaeology, and the other humanities fields to the public. We fund the preservation of historic records, collections, objects. We sponsor the educational opportunities for K-12 teachers across this nation and for students in the humanities. And we underwrite fundamental research across the disciplines of the humanities at universities and for independent scholars across this nation. And so it is my absolute pleasure to be here to introduce this panel, Monumental Decisions, which will be led by four scholars, four thinkers and writers, and their book signings will be on the lower level shortly after this program at 11.30. In terms of NEH, we have always taken an interest in memorials. I can say, for example, in 1979, the same year that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund was created, NEH issued a grant for a national symposium on issues raised by the memorial and plans for an archive of the soldiers' experiences in Southeast Asia. Our four guests have devoted so much time and research and, and wisdom to contemplating the complexity of who gets remembered in wars and why, and how the narrative of war changes in response over time. Uh, so our, our panelists include Professor Kristen Ann Haas, James Reston Jr., Professor Kirk Savage, and our moderator is Brent D. Glass. Of course, many of us in Washington know him as Director Emeritus of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. He is a public scholar. He particularly advanced the area of oral scholarship, oral histories, and oral narratives. He's a national leader in the preservation and interpretation of history. Glass also served as a member for a decade of the Flight 93 Memorial Advisory Commission. He is the author of 50 Great American Places, Essential Historic Sites Across the U.S. Brent will introduce our panelists, so please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Thank you, Chairman Petey, and, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's del a delight for me to chair this, this panel, and uh, I do want to recognize the National Endowment for the Humanities and the outstanding uh, support they give to scholarship in the humanities for, for many, many years, and all of us uh, on this panel, I believe, have benefited, and many of us in the audience have benefited from the support from NEH, so uh, it's a real honor to, to chair this panel sponsored by NEH. Um, we, um, the, the, the subject of, of statues and monuments and, and memorials, uh, of course, is not a new issue, and, but I think not since the time of Licinius, when uh, in the fourth century, Licinius uh, tore down some statues of uh, the Emperor Constantine and triggered a civil war. Uh, not since that time have, has there been so much uh, contention and discussion about statues and memorials. Um, and our panelists today uh, are very well prepared to talk about it, but with such a, uh, a good audience and an engaged audience, we, we've left time at the end of this session for you to participate. So it's very important uh, that we have your um, reaction to some of the, uh, some of the, the issues that will be raised uh, here this morning. So Kristen Haas uh, is the Associate Professor in the Department of American Culture and Director of the Humanities Collaboratory at the University of Michigan. She has written two books, Sacrificing Soldiers on the National Mall, A Study of Militarism, Race, War Memorials, and U.S. Nationalism. And the other book is Carried to the Wall, American Memory and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, uh, an exploration of public memorial practices material culture studies, and the legacies of the Vietnam War. 
Kirk Savage is the Dietrich Professor of History and Art and Architecture at the University of Pittsburgh. He is the editor of The Civil War in Art and Memory, the author of two books, Standing Soldiers, Kneeling Slaves, Race, War, and a Monument in 19th Century America, which is just out from Princeton University Press in its second edition, and also Monument Wars, Washington, D.C., the National Mall, and the transformation of the memorial landscape. James Reston Jr. is the author of 18 books, including Warriors of God and The Conviction of Richard Nixon, which inspired the play-turned-film Frost Nixon. He has also written three plays, numerous articles in national magazines, and an award-winning documentary about the 1978 Jonestown Massacre. His last five historical works have been translated into 13 languages. Warriors of God is an international bestseller with over 200,000 copies sold and still selling, which I think is always good news. Hmm. Fragile Innocence, uh, another one of his books, is a memoir of bringing up his handicapped daughter, and it reached uh, number eight on the Washington Post bestseller list. His new book is A Rift in the Earth, Art, memory, and the fight for a Vietnam War Memorial. So please welcome our panel. And what we're going to do is, this is divided into really four parts. First, I've asked our panel to talk a little bit about the intellectual path that led them to write their books on monuments and memorials. Uh, second, we will talk about um, their thoughts uh, concerning memorials uh, on the National Mall, uh, especially those that have been inspired uh, by the Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial, but, but memorials uh, that, have, that have appeared around the country since the Veterans uh, um, War Memorial has been dedicated. Uh, and then the third part of our panel will be to talk about mo making monuments and what we should think, be thinking about, about the monuments that were uh, dedicated uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, as a result of the commemoration of the Civil War. And finally, it will be your turn to, uh, to ask us questions or make comments. So just leading off, I will just mention briefly why I came to write 50 Great American Places. And David McCullough, who wrote the foreword to the book, uh, said to me, write the book that you would want to read. Uh, and the book I wanted to read uh, had three goals. One was to uh, uh, inspire history education. Uh, second was to encourage people to go out and visit uh, historic places. And the third uh, goal was to uh, encourage the preservation of our historic sites. Now, several of the sites that I write about <laughs> are also related uh, to the memorial landscape of America. Um, there's the USS uh, Arizona uh, in Pearl Harbor, uh, the Salem Witch Trial Memorial uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, of course, the National Mall, uh, the memorial at Wounded Knee, uh, South Dakota, and also the Statue of Liberty. And I may have a few comments to make about the Statue of Liberty because it's a great illustration of how some memorials wind up in the public consciousness in a very different way, have us, us thinking in a very different way than, than uh, how, what they were originally conceived to be. But I want to stop and um, let our panel um, uh, discuss the intellectual biography of their books, how they, how they uh, came to write uh, what they wrote about memorials and monuments. And uh, Kristen Haas, would you please lead, lead off? I'd be happy to. Um, good morning. I, I started with an interest in patriotism, in how patriotism works, in where that you hear the anthem and you get a hit of emotion. I was really interested in how that came to be, who made it, um, I was a hippie kid from Northern California um, and understood myself to be intensely patriotic. Um, and I was, as a young girl, fascinated by the First Ladies, um, which for my demographic was fairly unusual. And I wasn't interested in the First Ladies' dresses. I was interested in, for women who couldn't have access to the highest office, what it was like to stand next to that. Um, I was interested in emotional, uh, the emotional power of patriotism 
And um, that led me to an interest in public history. Who gets to make public history? Who, what are the stories we tell each other and ourselves about who we are and how we came to be? And that interest in public history um, led me, after I graduated from college, to an unpaid internship at the National Museum of American History. And my first job there was to work on an exhibit on everyday life in the 20th century. Um, what are the objects that would tell the story of American life in the 20th century to the millions of middle schoolers who move through that building? Um, the dress that um, Elizabeth Eckhart wore uh, on that famous day in Little Rock. Um, I was, so I was spending all my time thinking about kind of what are the objects that tell our story? And because it was an unpaid internship, I was a nanny, and I had an hour to myself every day. Um, so I was running around the mall, and running around the mall, I went by the Vietnam Memorial, first time noticing the objects, the boots, the flags, the flowers, the unexpected toys, um, second time thinking, what? is this? Third time stopping in my tracks and saying, this is an incredible expression of patriotism, but also a, a making of public history that was unsolicited, that was un, at that time, now there's a tragedy and everybody brings their stuff that did not happen in the United States. It's ubiquitous now. It didn't happen before the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So I brought my interests in the emotion of patriotism and the mechanics of patriotism and how public history more broadly is made to a study of those objects. And that's the produced my dissertation and then my first book carried to the wall and I wrote about um, why that mattered. And the second book is a follow-up. Um, I was interested in the objects still, but I was really interested in how the Vietnam Memorial, the objects, the place itself transformed memorial practices going forward. Thank you. Jim Reston, so rift, I, in, rift in, the, in the land. So I'm a veteran uh, that was in the Army from 1965 to 1968, fortunately only by happenstance, not in, in Vietnam. And afterwards, I became very involved in the amnesty movement for the return of uh, war resistors to the United States who had uh, gone into exile. And the first, the service in the army gave me a very deep um, understanding and sympathy for the soldier, especially the soldier who is at risk. Uh, and the experience with amnesty gave me a very deep interest in the whole question of reconciliation but particularly reconciliation after divisive war. Uh, of course, I was fo focused with amnesty on reconcili reconciliation after uh, Vietnam, but um, the historical parallel of the post-Civil War period with its amnesties for Southern soldiers and Southern leaders uh, was a real parallel in the argument for a universal amnesty for uh, Vietnam War resistors. So in a way, with this uh, current book, I was returning to some of those old emotional uh, roots. I always think that um, beyond intellectual interest in, in a subject, it's a very good thing to have an emotional connection to it. And in this case, there were two emotional roots. One was that I was uh, a good friend of Frederick Hart, who is the sculptor of the three soldiers at the Vietnam uh, Memorial. The, uh, the sculptures probably saved the, uh, the building of a Vietnam Memorial at all as controversial as they are artistically. So I was very interested in my interchanges with, um, with Rick Hart uh, about the battle over the Vietnam Memorial. The second is that uh, I have one uh, colleague fellow G GI who's on the wall, who was uh, killed in Wei January 30th, 1968. 
um, as the North Vietnamese came in invading the city of Way. And so in a way, uh, I personally uh, experienced the very heart uh, and the very essence of the Vietnam Wall of Maya Lin that the survivors of Vietnam look at their friends who are lost and see their own image reflected uh, in that wall. There was a third impulse, not so noble, that my daughter Maeve uh, finished her uh, master's degree at Dartmouth in Vietnam studies, and I went to her, uh, to her graduation ceremony, and we had uh, a chance to talk to her advisor, who was an advisor to Ken Burns's Vietnam, uh, magnificent uh, Vietnam documentary series. And this was, uh, uh, this was some time ago, and I asked this scholar, uh, well, when is the Ken Burns thing going to happen? And he said, oh, not for two years from now. So I thought, two years, that's about the time that it takes me to write <laughs> uh, a book. And uh, A Rift in the Earth was published uh, the day before. Ken Burns's documentary. Well done. Well done. National television. <laughs> Very good timing. Thank you. Kirk Savage, um, talk a little bit about the background that led you to write what you're writing, but then lead us into the next question, which is uh, thinking about uh, memorials and monuments, especially here in Washington, since the Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial, but uh, other examples, if you, if you choose to, since that time. Okay, so um, I, I'm kind of a scholar, a one-note scholar. I mean, I've been writing about public monuments uh, for over 30 years. Uh, I got interested in them as a college student um, in Westminster Abbey. I was fortunate enough to study in London. And seeing these incredible sort of public tomb monuments to these figures and trying to understand why they were erected and what they were doing. So I really came in through the art history side of things, uh, but when the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was being erected, I just became fascinated with the controversy surrounding it. Um, you know, I too grew up in the Vietnam War era, and so I had a lot of ties with, uh, my parents were involved in the anti-war movement, um, but the, um, the controversy itself was what really engaged me. How was it that formal design questions could suddenly become so emotionally significant, so politically significant to people, and really trying to understand the how and why of that. So it was kind of the perfect marriage of art and politics, which were really my two, my two uh, key interests. And so that's how I got into actually starting to write about public monuments, and from there it was to the, I realized that the Washington Monument <laughs> in the 19th century was kind of the mother of all controversies. Uh, and I began writing on that, and that propelled my interest in the National Mall. Uh, subsequent to that, I um, got the idea of writing a dissertation on Civil War memorials, which people in art history thought was an absolutely ridiculous idea, uh, because you know they were artistically insignificant, and so on and so forth. But that, for me, again, it was all about why were so many monuments erected and you know, from both sides in the war, and what was their function, their purpose, and why were people so invested in them became the questions that I, I got interested in. And it was only through that process of doing the research that more and more and more I became really, uh, uh, became more and more aware of the importance of the story of slavery and emancipation in the uh, erection of Civil War memorials. And so that's really what my first book that came about was really how was the story of, of slavery and emancipation told in the memorial landscape after the Civil War. Uh, and <coughs> um, I, you know, I have ancestors on both sides in the war, but my father's family is from Alabama and with deep roots there. And so that also partly drove my, my interest, particularly in the Confederate monuments and in trying to grapple, really reckon in a serious way with the history of what I, I came to see as the history of white supremacy that lay behind the Confederate memorials. So you wanted me to segue into 
Yes, I'm going to just uh, check our time and what we're doing well. I just thought it would be useful from the, your perspective here to talk a little bit about monument making in the last 40 years and how that has been influenced by uh, legislation, how it's been influenced by just the, the experience of the Vietnam uh, War, uh, Veterans Memorial, and then for Kristen and, and Jim to also um, comment on that. We want to have sort of a conversation, but I do want to uh, reserve some time to talk about uh, what's uh, been, uh, even in this morning's New York Times, another article about the, uh, the uh, statue at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and uh, also allow our, our uh, uh, audience to participate. So please. Right. Uh, so, you know, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial really was a game changer, you know, in the history of monuments in the United States. And our, you know, other, my other panelists can talk more about this. Uh, but the, really, the public monument as a forum was really moribund at the time that that uh, mo memorial was erected. And the incredible outpouring of response to it, uh, its kind of immediate visceral success that it had, really changed um, the way everybody thought about public monuments at that time. It certainly drew in tons of scholarly attention, but also tons of popular attention to it. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden local communities and other groups, veterans groups, wanted to build monuments uh, uh, as well. And many of them following in some way or another some formula that, that was pioneered by Myelin. Um, in the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And so that's what then really has led to the transformation of the mall in the late 20th century with the addition of the Korean War Memorial and the World War II Memorial. And now we have several memorials authorized to uh, even more recent wars, the Global War on Terror, for example. <clears throat> and just to put this in context, there really was legislation uh, you know, after the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was erected. And, uh, the kind of monuments were now revived, the Congress began to worry about the fact that there was a limited space in the city, particularly in the mall area, for new monuments. And so they, they adopted the Commemorative Works Act, which was supposed to put the brakes on new memorial construction and, and created certain rules, like uh, a memorial to a person could only be erected 25 years after that person's death. A memorial to a war could only be erected 10 years after the declared end of that war. And um, that le legislation, of course, has been honored in the breach because many new proposals have come forward with which have gotten exemptions from that legislation, like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Education Center. Uh, and now most recently, the Global War on Terror, which is a war that is not only not over yet, but it's arguably never going to be over uh, in theory. So we have a situation now that is really uh, very, very different from where we started with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in 82. Kristen? I, I would add to that that in the United States, there have been two big memorial booms, two periods in which there was intense interest in memory more broadly, public memory more broadly, and memorials in particular. And the first, it's kind of important to understand, that was in the period from 1890 to 1920. And the memorials that were built in that period were built, um, they were Civil War memorials, but they came significantly after the war. And many of them were built by women's organizations on both sides, United Daughters of the Confederacy, Daughters of the American Revolution, all kinds of local women's organizations and national women's organizations really dedicated to uh, producing a very particular memory of the Civil War. Um, and after the First World War and the Second World War, there was very little interest in monumentality in stone that would make a particular meaning of those wars. Those wars were remembered by small local lists of names in a town square, um, but also really importantly by infrastructure, especially after the Second World War. World War II veterans in their American Legion meetings in their local newspapers were very explicit that they wanted infrastructure. My daughter, who's in the second row, went through much of her life wearing a t-shirt that said vets. 
because she swam for the Veterans Memorial swim team. It didn't really occur to her necessarily that she was honoring the service, uh, the incredible service of Americans during the Second World War, but in fact, that's what they wanted. They wanted kids to have pools and basketball courts, and, and it was Jan Scruggs and Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial that changed that, that made memorials matter again, and that inspired this incredible short-term transformation of the National Mall. Um, and I spent a lot of time kind of deep diving into the minutes of the meetings where people argued about the Korean War Veterans Memorial, the World War II Memorial, the unbuilt but completely fascinating um, Black Revolutionary War Patriots Memorial, the Women's Memorial, Women in Military Service Memorial, um, which fascinating was kind of paid for by the Saudis and the Kuwaitis, which is super interesting. Um, and the National um, Japanese American Memorial to Patriotism during World War II. So these memorials were built in this period entirely and explicitly both inspired by the wall and in response to the wall. And in the case of the two big most successful memorials, the Second World War Memorial and the Korean War Veterans Memorial correctives, explicitly correctives. We are gonna fix what's wrong with the Vietnam Memorial. What's wrong with the Vietnam Memorial in the view of the people who wanted to build these other memorials was that these same eighth graders who were going through the National Museum of American History were coming to the mall to this important site of national pilgrimage and learning that dying in an American war could be tragic and wasn't necessarily heroic. And in an era of an all-volunteer military, it's tricky. And so those memorials were built in response. Jim, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to comment on what we've heard uh, so far about the National Mall and the, Viet and the impact of the, the Vietnam War Memorial, but I'm also going to challenge you to then take us into a conversation about the Confederate memorial, the statues, and because I know you care deeply about that as well as a graduate of UNC yeah. and um, and someone who was uh, thought thought about this quite a bit. So, right. please take. So, if you have a look at a rift in the earth, uh, you'll see that I have a color section in there of the also rans of other concepts by other artists <coughs> for a Vietnam uh, memorial. And you see in that, in those also rands, the struggle that artists went through to try to conceptualize what would be appropriate for a lost war. Uh, and nobody can look at those, uh, those other examples without thinking how lucky we were that Maya Lin had her concept for, uh, for this, this thing. One of the things that interests me immensely about the Vietnam Memorial today is the evolution of it since it was, uh, it was built. In my view, it is no longer a veterans memorial. It's become globalized, it's become internationalized as a memorial for everyone. At the beginning, it was as if the veterans had, uh, it was their proprietary memorial and it was just for them. Uh, but as time has gone on, it's, uh, it's changed and it's become important to everybody. It's also, in a way, no longer about Vietnam. It's become uh, internationalized and um, made universal, universalized, I should say. Uh, as a comment, a commentary on all wars. Uh, the Vietnam Memorial is about the cost of war. And that's universal. That's a universal theme. And uh, it's one that will make that uh, memorial live forever. Uh, it also, as they've said, uh, been a game changer for the building of all war memorials, for example. Uh, when I went to Vietnam, there is, uh, uh, there is a memorial north of the uh, DMZ, which is uh, a memorial for the dead of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. 
And how do they memorialize that? By black granite slabs with the names of the dead in Vietnamese. So that's an example of how, what the impact of this artistic concept of, um, of remembering war, not for its glory and its service necessarily, but uh, simply for the cost of, and the carnage uh, of warfare itself. Um, the whole thing about the evolution of, uh, of Civil War memorials is, al is also a theme mm -hmm. here, it seems to me, that uh, when I was a student at Chapel Hill and, and a professor there for 10 years, the Silent Sam uh, statue was a joke figure. It was uh, this sort of generic, uninteresting statue with this soldier holding a, a gun, and he was Silent Sam because uh, he shot his gun off whenever a virgin walked by. Um, <laughs> that joke is actually not unique to uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, my daughter, for example, went to Cornell, and on the Cornell campus, there are statues of, of the two founders uh, that face one another, and there are footsteps in between the two statues. And the notion is that whenever a virgin walked by, the two statues, t statuary figures got up and met one another in the middle and shook hands. So, um, so Silent Sam was a totally benign, uninteresting, forgotten uh, piece. And suddenly by, honestly, some very fine scholarship, this 1913 dedication uh, of the statue was, uh, was discovered in all its horror and scurrilous white supremacist uh, rhetoric. And so suddenly Silent Sam takes life as a, as a, a very vibrant, passionate, uh, and scurrilous uh, symbol of white racism. Um, and what do we do about this sort of thing? Um, I've heard it said what needs to happen in the South is that there be a movement in which all of the South is swept. Every small town that has a Confederate soldier on a pedestal needs to be swept and these statues taken down in one way or another. Uh, I'm very concerned with the way in which uh, that Silent Sam statue was torn down and uh, destroyed. Uh, it uh, concerns me as a historian about what is the impact of that kind of action and where does it lead? Is, it, is, there, is this basically leading us towards a concept of the Civil War of glory on the northern side and humiliation and shame on the Confederate side and therefore any symbol of the Southern Confederacy is shameful. Um, this, this leads to uh, book burnings. And uh, I'm and a, 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 from the sanitizing uh, whitewashing of history, it leads to, uh, in my view, a very one-sided, one-minded uh, way of looking at history. Kirk, you want to uh, add anything to having sure. written? <laughs> written uh, and I was uh, interested in your book, uh, which has a, a, a long section on Monument Avenue and the Lee Memorial in Richmond. Uh, and I, I recommend to uh, the audience to look at the, uh, the mayor of Richmond commissioned a, uh, a very thoughtful process to evaluate what to do with Monument Avenue, and it's on, online on the, uh, uh, the, um, the City of Richmond's website. Uh, but I'd like you to, uh, I'm sure you've read that, looked at it, and uh, yeah. offer your uh, observations in light of what Jim has said. Sure, well this, I mean, this is a really vexed issue. I think, you know, Jim and I have, are, are maybe on somewhat different ends of the spectrum on this question. As an art historian, of course, I'm, I'm inclined towards preservation. If stuff isn't preserved, we can't study it. <laughs> so uh, that's a basic kind of bottom line. The problem is these monuments that are out in public space that are honored, they're honored by virtue of where they are. They were put up for particular reasons to 
actually advance certain agendas? And how do we reckon with that? And how do we contest those agendas now in the present? What's the right thing to do? There really aren't a lot of um, easy answers to that. My, my view is that the monuments themselves sanitize history. They, they tell a particular version of history. They were motivated by white supremacy. supremacy and they were meant to actually celebrate the triumph of white supremacy in the South. And that is a very difficult pill to swallow now. So I mean, I can just tell you from my own my personal experience in Pittsburgh, we had a monument erected to Stephen Foster, which featured a black, a barefoot, uh, black ban toothless black banjo player uh, sitting at his feet. And for a long time, it was also kind of like Silent Sam a joke, at least within the sort of like white professoriate like me, it was kind of a joke. But once Charlottesville happened and, and those people in the public sphere, particularly the African-American community, felt more empowered to actually speak up about this statue, we you know, saw how long they had been living with, painfully with this monument for so many years and had their voices, in fact, they had protested at different times, but their voices had been, for the most part, ignored. It has to be remembered that public space is not a level playing field where everybody has free speech. Uh, so public monuments were erected by people who had the power to erect them. Uh, and that power continues. And so that is the problem that we, I think, face today. And it has changed my thinking, I mean, I, I see a whole range of solutions possible for monuments, um, but none of them are easy, and none of them are cost-free. And I do see mo removal as one option. That's, in fact, what happened to my Stephen Foster statue, is it's gone now. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think it's, it's interesting, and I want Kristen to uh, offer a comment on this as well, but in addition to reading the report of the Monument Avenue Commission in Richmond, I recommend to you that you read Mitch Landrieu's uh, book uh, recently came out about his decision and the decision in New Orleans to remove the Confederate uh, statues. So you have one mayor, a, a white mayor in New Orleans, removing uh, the, the symbols of white supremacy. You have an African-American mayor in Richmond endorsing a uh, preservation of uh, a Civil War monuments. So we've got a very interesting conversation going on here in those two cities. And now we'll add to that um, where I went to school and where Jim Reston went to school at Chapel Hill and in North Carolina. Kristen, and then we're going to let the audience uh, have a chance. I, I would just add quickly that it's important to remember that memorials are fairly blunt instruments, and they are used as such, and that we don't need to hold on to memorials as the keepers of our history. That's why. That's why historians spend years and hours in the archives, right? There, there are more subtle and more complicated ways to tell histories. Um, and the reason that people want these memorials to come down is because they are successfully doing the work that the people who erected them wanted done. And so the, they're, they're working, and, and that's a problem because of what, the reasons they wanted them to be built. I'd like to uh, invite members of the audience to uh, participate for the remaining time we have. As, as you come to the microphone, I would just like to offer my uh, comment on one of the first Civil War memorials, which is the Stav Statue of Liberty. Now, most people, and this is what's fascinating to me about how memorials change in their concept, the French, uh, when they uh, wanted to gift the Statue of Liberty to the US, it was to celebrate the preservation of the republic, the preservation of democracy, and the abolition of slavery. And if you look carefully at the Statue of Liberty and look at her ankles, there's a broken chain on her ankles. That was a symbol of the abolition of slavery. However, from the 18, late 1860s when the statue was conceived to 1886 when it was finally dedicated, America had changed, uh, immigration had become a much more uh, important uh, issue, and the Statue of Liberty became associated with welcoming immigrants uh, to America. Uh, Emma Lazarus's poem, which was written as part of a fundraiser for the pedestal of the statue, uh, wasn't placed on the statue until uh, the early 20th century, but it was a well-known poem and really transformed the statue from a 
uh, preserving our, uh, uh, the preservation of American democracy to uh, welcoming uh, immigrants to the country and the symbol of, immig of immigrant, uh, the, the, the value of contribution of immigrants to our country. Now, audience, please. Thank you, and thank you to the panelists. I'd like to direct this question to Mr. Reston based on your experiences with Secretary Udall. We're talking about monuments today in the form of, of structures. I'd like to ask about national monuments to landscape. In particular, in the Clinton administration, um, President Clinton designated the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Utah, and President Obama designated the Bears Ears National Monument in Utah, uh, the first one to be co-managed by Native American peoples in the U.S. government. And the current administration has shrunken the size of both of those monuments. And I wonder, my question is, what does that say about changing values in America? And, and what does the larger statement about tearing down these, these structures say about our values as a country? Thank you. Jim, do you want to tackle that? Well, um, we had a telephone call, the three of us, the four of us, uh, about this <laughs> thing. And um, the concept uh, arose called presentism. And the definition of presentism is, is the application of your values today on past events. Uh, it's a very, I think, useful uh, concept for analysis of the Civil War memorial thing, because it raises the question of uh, how are our values today playing into how we look at memorials that were established long ago. Uh, and in the case of Silent Sam at uh, UNC, is it really fair to, um, to impose our values today on, um, on a generic statue of a, uh, of a Civil War um, soldier? Um, the, uh, you know, that, uh, that memorial was so benign for, uh, for so long without any of this uh, thing. So suddenly we are meant to feel what people felt in uh, 1913 in relation to our values. Uh, it should be remembered that 483,000 Southern men were casualties of the American Civil War. And so it, it, is, it is at least a part of the way in which uh, uh, these statues were erected, and this is where Kirk and I would have our debate, uh, that uh, those statues were partly erected for the grief of the loss of Southern boys, and perhaps secondarily for the whole process of invasion not necessarily for the protection of slavery, but the invasion of the South uh, by the North. So I think it's um, uh, not a complete explanation to just cast upon all of these uh, statues that were erected on the, uh, uh, about, the, about the Confederacy in relation to our values today. So we've got five minutes. We got about eight questions. If somebody evicts us, I will then have to leave. But let's make the questions real quick, and um, and our panel will yeah. will answer. Sure. I'd like to ask the panel to focus on Washington D.C. Sometimes I worry that monuments and memorials are like tattoos; that the first one is uh, glorious and meaningful, and the second one is also has some importance to the uh, to the subject. And then eventually you run out of space and your arms are covered with these things without any coherence or, or plan. And driving on Independence Avenue every day, I look over and see what's going to be the new Eisenhower Memorial. And I have no comment on the artistic value of it, but it looks like it's going to be very large. Aren't we eventually just going to run out of space and if this country endures for another 100 or 200 years, there will be no more room for a monument or a memorial. Kirk, do you want to take We, we will. The short answer is we will run out of space, <laughs> partly because monuments are so much larger now. So we're talking in terms, in Washington, we're talking in terms of acres, which is, I mean, when I thought of, saw the, you know, the site for the Eisenhower Memorial, I was thinking, why couldn't we just go back to the old-fashioned guy on a pedestal, you know, that didn't take up very much room. Um, 
<laughs> and the problem is that these monuments live forever, but they actually don't in the public consciousness. I mean, they become obsolete after a while, mm -hmm. uh, with some exceptions, like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So Philip Kennicott, for example, from the Washington Post, suggested maybe we could decommission war memorials after certain, a period of time, like 50 or 60 years. We could have a, a sunset uh, provision. Sunset, yeah, and put them out like in Arlington Cemetery with a wonderful ceremony, and then clear the ground. Okay, let's have, to, let's have a couple, oh yes, please. I, I just, I think we need to hope for war memorials to go out of fashion. We need to come into a period of greater ideological stability where we don't need them and right. we'll stop building them. Well, I would just, let's have, let's have, see if we can have a question without a preamble. So we'll, so. Uh... Thank you. Uh, a, a short preamble. My father fought in the Korean War and I'd like you to discuss uh, how the Korean memorial came to be why it took so long, and you said that you'd done some research on the archives as to the process. Could you talk a little bit about that? So uh, briefly, it was very explicitly a response to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was intended as a corrected, corrective. It was intended to be heroic, masculine, um, and celebratory in ways that the Vietnam Memorial was not perceived to be. The biggest there were many debates and fights. The most intense was about race. Everywhere you look, it doesn't matter if the war memorial doesn't seem like it's going to be about race. It ends up being about race. Um, the original design had 38 all-white figures, um, which you know, turned out to be a problem. Um, and then there was intense debate about which of the 19 figures in the final design would be raced in what way. And when I talked to the sculptor Frank Gaylord on the telephone, one of the very first things he said, I asked him about the first figure, and he said, God damn it, he's white. He has a broad nose, but he's white. I'm white, and I have a broad nose. Um, so there was intense debate about the, how big their lips were, whether or not that made them look lazy, about whether or not they had limp wrists. So, so that's a very short answer to a super interesting question. Thank you. I think we're gonna have the last question. No, two minutes, okay, good. I have the shortest question for Mr. Savage. For the uh, Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall, the Emancipation Proclamation is omitted. Should it be there, and was it omitted accidentally or deliberately? Well, I'd say deliberately, I mean, because the, the, <clears throat> the idea behind the, ins the inscriptions was to try to avoid the issue of slavery in, and to turn Lincoln from the emancipator figure that he had been to more of a reunifier figure. So that's why they chose the Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural. Of course, though, the problem is the Second Inaugural has this incredible line about slavery and about mm -hmm. how the war was about slavery and it's our punishment for the crime of slavery. It's really the only place in the memorial landscape of Washington uh, that really talks about the crime, the historical crime of slavery. So it, it's, a, it's a, mixed, a mixed bag. I, I encourage you to go and read the second inaugural at the Lincoln Memorial, because you could look it up, but it's more powerful reading it there. And then the Gettysburg Address calling for a new birth of freedom, I think, uh, suggests what the war was all about. One yeah, more just, question, uh, wrap it up. Sorry. Wrap it up. Yeah, sure, Jim. Yeah. Well, I, what we haven't had time to talk about is this whole thing of contextualizing the uh, <coughs> Civil War uh, memorials. And there's a very interesting effort to do that in Richmond, where mm -hmm. yes. in, right after 2000, a Lincoln Memorial was, uh, was built to go in front of the Civil War mem uh, Museum in, in Richmond. It's a lovely statue with uh, Lincoln and his son Ted, um, who uh, visited Richmond when it was still smoldering uh, at the very end of the Civil War. He was very much open to assassination there. So that is meant to be a counterpart to the, to the monument um, boulevard thing. But does that really contextualize uh, monument boulevard? I don't think so. Our authors will be around all day. Please give them a, a round of applause for a wonderful <laughs>